Welcome back, everybody, to the Cleveland Guardians franchise here on MLB The Show 22. Today, we have made it to the offseason with year number two in the books. It was a very successful season that came to an unfortunate end as we lost in Game 5 of the American League Division Series by the score of 4-1 to to the Toronto Blue Jays. We really struggled to hit the ball in the playoffs. We had 32 walks through those five games, which is more than our 31 hits. Despite having the second best on base percentage of every team in the postseason, we really struggled to hit the ball and we struggled to consistently get extra base hits. We were really bad with runners in scoring position. As a team, we had a 159 batting average with runners in scoring position. And if you remove our three best hitters through the five playoff games, Cattell Marte, Josh Bell, and Eddie Rosario, everybody else on the roster was 0 for 25 with runners in scoring position. The pitching was fine. Obviously, Shane Bieber was fantastic pitching in four of the five games, three of which out of the bullpen. But the rest of the pitching was good, but not great. They didn't lose as the series, but they didn't win it. The offense was definitely a lot better during the regular season. We hit the ball phenomenally during the season itself, but when it came down to the playoffs, we struggled. The pitching during the regular season was fine, a little bit inconsistent at times, but for the most part, pretty solid. So as we go into this offseason, we're really focused on improving the team for the short term and the long term. I want to keep this team really good and at the top of the American League Central next year, but I also want to improve our team for the long term. We've got a lot of big decisions to make, including that of Jose Ramirez. He's a free agent this offseason, coming off a slightly down year, and he really struggled in the playoffs, hitting below 150. He drew a ton of walks in the playoffs, but he could not hit the ball to save his life. He's not the only free agent. We've also got Josh Bell, Eddie Rosario, Jose Alvarez, Omar Narvaez as well. All of those guys, their contracts are up, and they will be hitting the open market in the offseason. I really want to focus on the batting clutch rating. I know that's kind of like a rating that we don't really talk about a whole lot, but that's what has to do with runners in scoring position, which was our team's big issue in the playoffs. Our two best hitting prospects have good batting clutch, but hopefully we can add another guy or two who we can count on in big time situations. I also want to mix up the pitching rotation. I definitely want to add a lefty arm, and I want to see some change to the starting pitching staff because I think it's good, but not great, and I think a fresh arm would do as well. So as we go into the offseason, we start with the retirement stage. A lot of big names calling it a career. I think the most notable one would be Justin Verlander, the former American League Cy Young winner with my Detroit Tigers. Plenty of other recognizable names in here. Uh, Andrew Miller, I would say, was the most notable among former Cleveland players. He wasn't in Cleveland very long, but when he was, he was very good during their World Series push back in 2016. Nobody made the Hall of Fame. I think Justin Verlander not getting in there should be a crime as we now get into the offseason. We've got this first stage of exclusive free agent negotiations and the staff positions. Last year, we completely wiped off the coaching staff and hired a bunch of new guys, and I thought the staff did a pretty good job. We do have holes at the third base coach and the farm director. For the third base coach, we're going to go with Cleveland Perkins. He was our third base coach last year, so we're going to bring him back on a two-year deal for about $1.4 million per season. As for the farm director, we will be looking at Gregory Loftus. I don't like the low walks per nine, but he has big boosts in speed, contact, and my new favorite rating, Clutch. Both of those managers would accept their positions and join the coaching staff. As for the exclusive rights for agents, we've got six guys here. The first one, Carlos Santana. Spent most of the year in the minors. I don't think I'm going to bring him back. Jose Alvarez was fine. He's not that expensive, but I don't think we're going to bring him back. I'd like to get a little bit younger with the bullpen. Omar Narvaez had a pretty good season as our backup catcher, but he wants north of $6 million per season, and as a backup catcher, I don't really think it's worth it. Eddie Rosario was a nice pickup after the trade deadline. He's not that expensive, but again, I wouldn't mind getting younger in the outfield, so I think we're going to let him go. And that brings us to these top two, the first of which is Josh Bell, who was very good in the regular season, very good in the playoffs. We have a mutual team and player option for $8 million this season, so if we agree to the club option and he agrees to the player option, he'll be back for $8 million. We're going to accept the club option, but he has to accept the player option for him to be back next year. Otherwise, we're going to need to sign him to a new deal. 
As for Jose Ramirez, I thought about it for a little bit, and I think it would be in our best interest to bring him back. He is a cornerstone for this team. He wants to be here in Cleveland, and he's not that expensive. Three years, $51.5 million is the offer. I don't want to give him too long of a deal because he is 31. He's going to start to regress. He has a player option for that third year as well. Josh Bell declined his $8 million player option, so he is now an exclusive rights for agent. We're going to offer him a very similar deal to what we did last year. Two years, $19 million with a club and player option. So he's going to get a slight raise from $8 million per season to about nine and a half. Josh Bell has accepted. Jose Ramirez has not yet. So we're going to give him the qualifying offer. That way, if we lose him, we can get a draft pick for him as compensation. So now we're in the free agency stage. We're going to go through the dirty work first. Starting with the 40-man roster, we're not going to add anybody. For arbitration, I offered everybody here except for Shane Bieber and James Karinczak. No, we're not letting them go, obviously. We're actually going to be offering both of them contract extensions. Just like Jose Ramirez, Shane Bieber is a cornerstone for this organization. We're going to offer him a four-year, $128 million deal. It'll be backloaded, and it'll have a club and player option from a fourth year. I want him to be the ace of the staff going forward, and hopefully he's not going anywhere. As for James Karinczak, we're going to give him a four-year deal for $21 million, which will wrap him up through his age 31 season. So I want to keep both of these guys locked up for the long haul. Then we get to the tendering contract stage. I offered Camilo Duvall a long-term deal for five years, $18 million. I want to keep him, James Karinczak, and Emmanuel Classe in the back end of the bullpen for a while. I didn't offer anybody else a super long deal. I thought about giving a big contract to George Valera, but I'm not ready to do that yet. I want to see him perform at a high level on a bigger sample size before I'm thinking about offering a seven or eight your contract for a hundred plus million dollars because that's probably what he would be anticipating if we were to offer him a big contract extension. We let go of a few minor leaguers, but for the most part, everybody here is going to be coming back next year into the organization, whether they're going to be on the major league team or somewhere in the farm system. So now that brings us into free agency. A lot of big names here headlined by Shohei Otani. Of course, Jose Ramirez is here in free agency as well. We still have our $51 million offer on him. It's a very talented free agency class. A lot of really good players. We're going to start real quick with Jose Ramirez. I'm going to up the offer to $54.5 million. So that's an extra million dollar per season. So now I, we're going to look at some guys around the league who we may want to offer a contract to. I was scrolling through some relievers. I think Aaron Loop would be a nice addition, 36 years old, had a great season last year with the Angels. He's been very consistently good for a number of years now, and I think he'll be a nice lefty arm to have in the bullpen. I also wanted to sign another starting pitcher. As I said, I want to revamp the starting rotation a little bit. There were a few names who caught my eye. Luis Castillo from the Reds. He's been very good the past two seasons, and he probably would have been the guy I picked had he not been so expensive. He wants like $17 million a year. The guys who are his rating want like half of that. Another former Cincinnati Red who could make sense is Tyler Malley. He's younger, he's better than Luis Castillo, but he's also very expensive, and I don't want to spend that much money on a starting pitcher since we're already going to be spending a lot on Shane Bieber. I would like to add a lefty, maybe Jordan Montgomery. He's had ERAs in the fours the past two seasons, so I'd be a little bit hesitant on giving him a deal, although $6.4 million isn't that bad. And then I come to Blake Snell. I think he'd make a lot of sense. He hasn't had an ERA lower than four in the past three seasons, but I'm still very inclined to give him an offer. I think the ceiling is high with Blake Snell, and there's still some untapped potential with him. He's a little bit inconsistent, but when he's on, he's really good. We're going to give him a two-year deal for $27 million. Not quite as long as what the Padres are offering him, but more money per season, so hopefully he takes that. I thought about going after a big fish like a Jorge Polanco or a Cody Bellinger. I figured with Bellinger here, why not give him an offer? Cody Bellinger is an interesting case because he's got all the talent in the world. He just hasn't been able to stay consistent. The past two seasons, he has been quite productive. So I don't want to offer him a long-term deal, but why not offer something short? Two years, $34 million of a player option for year two. Not overly expensive, not overly financially committing. That way, if he ends up being horrible, we can always back out of that contract if we wish. So these are the four players we're going to offer here in the opening stages of free agency. We're going to start simulating now, see if those guys accept our deal, see what happens around the rest of the league, 
And the first free agent domino to fall ended up being a very, very big one. Shohei Otani signs an eight-year contract with the New York Yankees. So he leaves the Angels to sign with the Yankees. We always know the New York Yankees have what feels like unlimited money, and they pull out the purse for one of the most talented players of this generation, just like how Babe Ruth left the Red Sox for the Yankees. Now the next great two-way player 100 years later does the same, although I think Babe Ruth was traded. Shohei Otani was a free agent, so slightly different, but you get the point. As for us, we do get some contract news. Shane Bieber has officially accepted his four-year deal, so he is going to be under contract until 2027. We do have an out after the 2026 season, so he's under contract for three to four more years. Matt Chapman signed a deal with the San Francisco Giants. That's a big get for them. They always like to spend plenty of money as well. And as you can see on the transaction log, Jose Ramirez has signed his three-year, $54.5 million extension. So just like Shane Bieber, he is not going anywhere. The two big cornerstones of our organization, Shane Bieber and Jose Ramirez, have been locked up to long-term contract extensions. I want them to be a part of this team when we hopefully win a World Series eventually. And I think re-signing them here will certainly do that as the two faces of our organization going forward. Throughout my MLB The Show franchises, I haven't started with like big cornerstone players like them, so it will be interesting to see how we navigate through our budget going forward as James Karinczak and Camilo Duvall both accepted their long-term deals as well. So Karinczak's going to be here another four years. Duvall is going to be here for another five years. The two of them, along with Emmanuel Classe, who still has three years left on his deal, is going to be a nasty back end of a bullpen going forward. We already have around $100 million tied up into our players. We have gotten Aaron Luke to sign his deal, but we have not gotten word from either Cody Bellinger or Blake Snell quite yet. So that $100 million could rise way up. Carlos Correa has been traded from the Twins to the Braves. Very interesting. Correa's on the final year of his deal, and Minnesota's going to get a couple corner outfield prospects in Ragnar Eriksson and Lucas Mason. Jack Flaherty stays in the NL Central. He signs a nine-year, $200-plus million deal with the Chicago Cubs. Hunter Renfro signs with the Mets. I think that's a really good move for them. Renfro was the National League MVP in 2022, and he only signs for seven a year. We would also get the news that Blake Snell has accepted our deal, so he is now with the team on a two-year, $27 million deal. If it doesn't work out, we do have an out after the first year. So if he struggles, we can always let him go. But I think it'll be nice to have a lefty and some fresh blood in the pitching staff. This means we're probably going to trade one of our current starters. Obviously, it won't be Snell and it won't be Shane Bieber because we just extended him. But the other four guys, maybe we look to move one or even two of them. Cody Bellinger, unfortunately, will not be signing here. He's no longer interested in our offer as the Brewers will acquire Kike Hernandez from the Red Sox. And then Cody Bellinger signs a five-year, $90 million deal with the Padres. So just like Clayton Kershaw last year, Bellinger leaves the Dodgers for the arch-rival Padres, which is very interesting. Although Cody Bellinger's been a part of three World Series teams with the Dodgers, I don't really know how that fan base is going to welcome him back next year. After two years in Seattle, Jesse Winker returns to the Cincinnati Reds. Four years, $78 million. Julio Urias stays in the NL West. He signs a six-year deal with the Diamondbacks. The Dodgers are losing a ton of talent. They've already lost Cody Bellinger and Julio Urias today. They did extend Trevor Bauer, but it doesn't really seem like they've made that many big moves really from last year or this year. They're still the Dodgers. They're still loaded. But unlike the other main big market team with the New York Yankees, the Dodgers aren't spending that much money. Wilson Contreras has been traded after just one year with the Red Sox. He's going to the Angels. They add to their lineup over to replace Shohei Otani. And that'll bring us to the Rule 5 draft. Last year, we selected Ryan Bliss, a move that I feel like kind of backfired with Rule 5 players not being able to go down to the minor leagues in their first full season. We were kind of stuck with him on the roster, and he was kind of a black hole on offense. So I think we're going to be a little bit more careful with what we choose to do here in the Rule 5 draft. We had the 20th pick in the first round. If there's no one we like on the board, we can always skip this pick. The only player I was slightly tempted by on the board is corner outfield prospect Heston Kerstead from the Baltimore Orioles. We know Kerstead pretty well from our Orioles franchise last year, and it was definitely a mixed bag with Kerstead in that series. There was a lot of good, there was a lot of bad. 
I would have thought about picking him if not for the Ryan Bliss thing last year, but that kind of scared me away from doing it. So I ultimately decided not to, and we're not going to pick anybody in the Rule 5 draft. We did, however, lose one of our outfield prospects in Julio Pablo Martinez, who was picked by the Chicago Cubs. So unfortunately, he is no longer with our organization. We're going to simulate now to the month of February, but before that, I wanted to offer some minor league deals to a few guys down here. Luis Rengifo, an infielder, is probably the most notable player we went after. Good defense, good plate skills, but just doesn't have the raw offensive ability to be a great starter. And then a bunch of minor leaguers down the board. We don't have enough roster spots for all these guys, so I did end up making a couple of trades to try and clear some roster spots, but in the process, also get some good prospects. So I put a group of minor leaguers in the trade finder who aren't all that good, and we can get Eloy Jimenez from the White Sox, which is not realistic at all. I'm not going to do that, but MLB The Show's trade logic, as you can see, is still broken. I ended up doing this trade instead. Kevin Kelly, Carson Tucker, and Reese Hines going to the Baltimore Orioles for a couple of B potential prospects. None of these guys are all that special. I guess Tucker was a former first-round pick, but he's had a hard time staying healthy, and when he has been healthy, he hasn't been all that good. The two guys we're getting are Taj Bradley, a 23-year-old right-handed starting pitcher, and third baseman Kobe Mayo. Last year in the Orioles franchise, I always really liked using Kobe Mayo whenever I played with the minor league teams, so I'm excited to have him back, and the Orioles would do that trade. We've now got to move with the Tigers. We're going to be sending them Stephen Kwan. I know he's a fan favorite, but he wasn't very good last year, and we're just super crowded in the outfield. We just don't have a spot for him. So Kwan, along with a couple of prospects in Kike Rios and Junior San Quentin, are going to Detroit for catcher Eliezer Alfonso. Alfonso will likely be our backup catcher at the big league level this season. With Omar Narvaez gone, we needed a replacement. The Tigers don't need him. They have so much depth at catcher, and they have Kiebert Ruiz, who's a great starter. So they have no spot for Alfonso, which is why I feel they'd be willing to move him, and we're going to make that deal. We're going to be sending a couple of B potential prospects to the Rays. Jamal Bastafka is a 23-year-old outfielder who spent last year in AA along with Logan Allen, who at one point was a top prospect in the organization, but just has not really panned out, along with shortstop Jose Tena. They are going to Tampa Bay for Manuel Margot, who's not a prospect. He's going to be somebody who contributes to the major league level. Margot is a below-average offensive player, but he's very consistent. He is usually finished with right around a 700 OPS. You know what you're going to get with him, probably hitting around 250, Decent power, but nothing that's going to wow you somewhere between 7 to 14 home runs a year. Great defender, and he's on the last year of his contract, so he'll be able to play center field at a very high level defensively, and it's not a long-term thing because he's on the final year of his deal. Simulating forward now, Alberto Mondesi signs with the Blue Jays. Iramon Marquez to the New York Mets on a big contract, improving their pitching staff. And then the Astros will make a couple of splashes here, not only with Josh Hader, but also Jacob DeGrom. So they get one of the best relievers and one of the best starters in all of baseball, improving their already very good pitching staff. Harrison Bader signs a big deal with the Texas Rangers. Uh, Sunshine, Mike Clevenger is going to the Angels. And then look at this. The Oakland A's signed Lucas Giolito for $183 million. That's pretty much the entire Oakland A's payroll. I don't really know why they did that. Clayton Kershaw is now in our division. He signed to the White Sox on a one-year deal. He was still very productive with the Padres last year. So here in February, the only really notable free agent left is Rafael Devers. He's got a few small offers, and he would eventually accept a six-year deal from the Miami Marlins on a very team-friendly contract. Shout-out to the Marlins for getting a stud on very low amounts of money. For the arbitration hearings, for the most part, the arbitration panel sided with the players over the team, which means they're going to make a little bit more money than we had hoped for. So we are now at the end of the offseason. This is really like where I get active in the trade market, and we're going to have to because we're actually under budget. We've spent a little bit too much money on the anti-Dolan. I'm actually spending too much money on this team. So I had said I wanted to maybe look to move one of these starting pitchers, this is where we're going to do that as well. But before that, I actually had a different trade that uh, we're going to do. Miles Straw and Keenan Middleton are going to New Orleans for outfielder Jesus Sanchez. With us acquiring Manuel Margot earlier today, I felt like that was the nail in the coffin for Miles Straw's time here. Straw's a great defender, but he does struggle at the plate. He did not have a good year hitting the baseball this season with an OPS at just 640. 
and we're just super crowded in the outfield. There's no real spot for him, and I think getting Sanchez is a big upgrade. We do have to give up Keenan Middleton, which does suck. He's a good bullpen arm. He's pitched 70 and two-thirds innings with us over the last two seasons with an ERA consistently in the low threes, but I think it's worth it here for both sides. The Marlins are getting a nice haul for Sanchez, who hits left-handed, which is relevant because really their core guys, Jazz Chisholm, lefty, Rafael Devers, lefty, Khalil Watson, lefty. They don't need all of these left-handed bats, so I think Jesus Sanchez is a little bit more expendable for them, but for us, we're getting a stud. This guy consistently has an OPS around 800 or so. He's only 26 years old, so I'm confident that will go up. I've had my eye on Sanchez really since season number one, and I've wanted to make a move for him for a while. I felt now was the right time to do so, and we do it. We've got one more trade here. Aaron Savale is going to the St. Louis Cardinals. As we've said, there's an odd man out in the rotation, and it's going to be Savale, who's a good player, 28 years old. He's been very average the past couple of seasons. St. Louis needs a starting pitcher bad. Their current number two guy is Steven Nats. Not pretty. We're getting two good B potential prospects in starting pitcher Michael McGreevy and shortstop Mason Wynn. McGreevy's only 23 years old. Wynn is only 22. So I think that's a fair haul for a guy like Savale, who still has some upside at only 28 years old with multiple seasons left of team control. After making those moves, I would wrap up the offseason with making some changes to the 40-man roster. I wanted to give some of our young prospects an opportunity in spring training. Guys like Will Benson, Ramon Romero, Daniel Espino, and Zane Rowley. All guys with outside shots of making the big league club this year. But I wanted to give them an opportunity against big league talent. So that wraps up the offseason, and I feel we, we did a really good job. We retained our core. We signed Shane Bieber and Jose Ramirez to multi-year extensions. We added some lefty arms to the rotation and the bullpen by signing Blake Snell and Aaron Loop. We made some nice position player moves by trading for Eliezer Alfonso, the backup catcher. And we made some nice moves in the outfield with Jesus Sanchez and Manuel Margot. I think we improved the farm system as well. We added some good prospects like Taj Bradley, Michael McGreevy, Kobe Mayo, and Mason Wynn. In doing so, we did not give up any of our top prospects within the organization. So as I said in the beginning of the episode, my goal was to improve the team for the short term, which I feel like we did. I think this roster is better than it was a year ago. And I also think it's better for the long term. I think we improved the farm system. We made some nice additions for the future. And we added young players who I think can be building blocks for the organization going forward. So as we start season three, I'm going to give you guys a choice. Would you rather that I stream spring training within the next couple of days or should I just jump right into the regular season and we'll just skim through spring training in the opening day episode? Let me know which one of those you would rather see me do down below in the comments. Make sure to like button and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Let me know what you thought of all of our off-season moves down below as well. Peace out.